analyze the data because it's time race on how to study this mathematics and uh, it's quite challenging but I think it's very accurate. And, and I'll, I'll be focusing on a type of calorimetry called isoparabolic and uh, there's two types of that. There's plasmatons, there's a uh, cell where the heat is transferred by radiation, electromagnetic radiation. Uh, if you calculate this, it's mostly infrared radiation, not visible. Uh, and then Channel Lake, I work mostly on another type of isoparabolic calorimetry where really, the main heat pathway is by conduction. But uh, if I choose a, a, a dual isoparabolic calorimetry, uh, relatively low cost, you can run multiple cells, you don't have a lot of funding, you can still run quite a few cells. Wide dynamic range uh, from the cell. From the operation of your cell bath up to about the boiling point of the, of the heavy water. Uh, it has the, also a dynamic range of zero to about 10 watts. 10 watts is where everything will start to boil, and so you can't go much above that once you reach, reach the boiling point of the heavy water. It's an open system, so it's self purifying. Uh, like hydrogen, regular hydrogen liquidizes more readily than heavy hydrogen or deuterium. So if you have contamination by water, you will, you'll clear that out as it operates and uh, you'll get rid of the light hydrogen. Uh, the heat transfer is mainly by radiation if you have the doer type, it's then by production if you have the high phase of channel A. And another point I forgot to mention, Mike, you could be reminded me of this. This doer cell is uh, glass and you can actually see what's going on inside the cell. And it's definitely a big advantage. You can actually see what, what's happening in your, elect in your, elect in your electrolyte and you know, what's happening inside the cell. Inherent safety because any DT and O2 uh, exits the cell and uh, doesn't hang around for any possible explosion. And high accuracy is possible to, uh, down to plus or minus 0.1 milliwatt or plus or minus 0.01%. A lot of people don't do that perhaps, but after studying this very carefully, and I'm convinced that uh, I, I don't get that accurate, but what Martin Heisman's calculations, I, I actually believe he actually gets that accurate. And I'll show you the so well. Okay, okay, next, uh, next we grab. This is the typical plasma pons dura cell that started the controversy uh, in 1989, except later on they, they silvered the upper one third of the cell, which, which improved the cell. And so that's one advantage that came later. Uh, uh, the, the, the plate and cathode is down here, and the platinum wire coiled around it. Everybody's pretty familiar with that. It has an in cell heater, uh, so you can apply a heater power periodically, which he does uh, for calibration purposes. And, uh, the cell I used in Japan, to give you an idea of the size, this cell held 90 milliliters of heavy water. This, this is much bigger than what I used in China Lake, a 90 milliliter, milliliter volume. The China Lake had an 18 milliliter volume, about one-fifth the size. So this is, it's about, uh, about this tall in, in actual size, uh, 28 uh, centimeters tall. Uh, okay, next, next uh, slide. Th this is an example of Data I took in Japan using the Fleischmann Pons calorimeter on the plate of boron made by Naval Research Laboratory. Dr. Elon right here made this material, and this is a very, a very good material in everything that I've done. But uh, this is the excess power he calculated, uh, the vertical axis and the horizontal axis is the time. These two vertical lines is when, we, when, he, when the, the, the in cell heater comes on. It, it applies 25. Uh, uh, well, 250 milliwatts of uh, power when the heater comes on. We weren't seeing much excess power. This is very early in the experiment. This is the third day, the first time the heater pulse was applied. And we're still running the cell at low currents, 150 milliamps. So you don't expect a lot of excess power. But uh, as, as you switch on the heater, you can see the jump right here is almost, almost exactly the 0.25 or 250 milliwatts power of the in cell heater. But there's a thing called positive feedback, and this showed up often in the plating boron system. When you raise the temperature, you increase the power, or you stimulate the effect. Dennis Craven's often talked about that. When you, you shake things up, you stimulate something. So this, is a, this changes cell temperature. And, and normally this would be straight, go straight across, across flat. There was no excess power being developed and, and until the heater was turned off. You see, it kept on increasing over this uh, uh, six hour period when the, the heater was on. It went up to by about 30 milliwatts of excess power. And when the in-cell heater switches off, there's a sudden drop, and from here to here, 
is again the 250 milliwatts. Exactly. But you see the excess power continues. Now we're now the cell's cooling down and it does sort of gradually fade away, but it never really totally went away. And uh, we had excess power very early in the experiment with the plate warm system. It showed up very early. Uh, the next few graph. Another advantage of the newer cell is you can you can calculate pretty accurately what the cell constant should be by using the Stefan Boltzmann constant, well known constant, at least in physical chemistry, for, for radiation. And if you, by calculating the, the, the effective uh, uh, inner glass surface of the cell, that, that area that's, that's transmitting this electromagnetic radiation, and multiplying these two things together, the speed of Stefan Boltzmann constant and the area, you come up with a value for the cell constant for that particular size cell. And, and we would find experimentally that we would, we would usually come very close to that calculated value unless the cell was old. If it's had it on for five years, you'd, you'd lose the vacuum, heat it from the atmosphere, we know it diffuses through glass very slowly, and, and you'd lose some of that vacuum, and there'd be more heat transferred by radiation. So then the constant would go up very slowly over time very good. If you had a good vacuum in a new cell, it was very accurate. What you calculate is what you measure. Uh, uh, next slide. Uh, I don't want to get into a lot of math because uh, well, Mark loves math and I like math. Most people here probably don't. But uh, the, uh, Mark likes to lump several terms together, power terms, the radiation power, which is the biggest term in his cell, and the conduction, heat conduction, heat power conducted by, by regular conduction, and, and the work done by the gases generated. Uh, he lumps these together into a pseudo radiative power term and a pseudo radiative uh, cell constant. Just so you don't have to carry all these terms along, and, and they're, they're small except for the, for the term we are interested in, the radiative term. And, and F of T, of course, is the, the fourth power, because when you have radiation, it's the fourth power equation. Uh, and so your, your cell equation becomes this. This is, again, the first law of thermodynamics expressed, that, that Mike talked about, expressed in, uh, in power. Uh, he, uh, and for, this is the system is your calorimetric cell. And, and the distance determined that covers that calorimetric cell. Then you have the electrical, electrochemical power that goes in, any heater power you put in, any excess power, if any, that develops, the power carried away by the gases coming out of this open cell, the carrying hydrogen gases, and also water vapor. Very important term is the water vapor that is carried off out of the cell as well. And, and, the, and then the, the, the radiative heat transfer coefficient. So this is the key equation. When you go, go through everything, of course, there's expressions that you hide out expressions different various terms, but this makes it so you put it all in one line by uh, not going and putting expressions in all the terms. But the important thing is this is a differential equation, and Martin integrates this. So you, you, you do the integration, and this is a, you rearrange it, and the left-hand side, you can put it in a straight line form. This is y, this, the left-hand side. Uh, x is everything except the CPM. This, the, the water equivalent of the cell turns out to be the slope of the straight line. X is everything else in this term except the CPM. And your constant, your, your y-axis intercept, is the uh, cell constant. So you can, you can plot this data out, and by the intercept of the y-axis, you can get a very accurate value for the cell constant by this integration. Well, uh, how do we do integration? Well, there's a lot of ways. Uh, there's a simple way is just to take the average value and multiply that by the upper and lower limits. That gives you a value for the uh, numer numerical integration. Or you can use Simpson's rule or the trapezoid rule. And Mar Martin's used all three, I think. But, but the point is, to get the most accurate result, you have to integrate the data. And you do this, you can do this numerically. Okay, the next view, Brad. This shows the results of integrating the data. This is actually the cell I ran in Japan. And, and look how, how closely all this points uh, fall on a straight line. And you can you got to this point that to, 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 to uh, x equals zero, you get the, the y intercept. And uh, you can actually get this constant, this cell constant, pseudo radiated pseudo radial uh, radiated heat transfer coefficient to five decimal places. I, I know a lot of people maybe don't believe that, but uh, the last place is probably uncertain. I'll, I'll grant you that. But I think the rest is pretty accurate. And from the slope, you you can get the heat capacity of the system. And uh, and that, for this particular system, that's 450 joules per degree. But, but this, is, this is a cell constant. Another point people understand, we don't change that cell constant. 
Once we get the cell constant, we know exactly what it is. We use the same cell constant throughout the experiment. So this guy was used for all further calculations. And it was even used in the next experiment, because we assumed it wouldn't even, it wouldn't even change when we went to the next experiment, because everything was pretty much the same. And the next experiment we did in Japan was co-deposition, and I'll talk about that briefly uh, tomorrow. Okay, the next few graph. This is a different cell, it's smaller, and therefore you don't have as much surface, and therefore when you extrapolate it, you get a smaller constant. This is a, uh, this is actually extrapolates to 0 0.06216 times 10 to minus 9 watts per degree to the fourth power. Uh, uh, we don't show all the units here. Martin, this is Martin's uh, actual data. He, he doesn't show all the units. But, but the units on both the y-axis and x-axis are the units of the cell constant. Watts per degree to the fourth power. And, uh, and you, you see you can get a very good straight line and a very accurate cell constant by this extrapolation. Uh, okay, next, next, next slide. Uh, Martin ran a control system, and uh, in this control system, he used heavy water, but he did not use palladium for the cathode, he used platinum for the cathode. So he would not expect any excess heat released by due to the platinum, due to the platinum in the system. Now, the way Martin drew this originally is kind of hard to see what is what. So I, I made these red dots big and so they're obvious. This, this is what he gets when he integrates. This is the excess power he gets by integration. The other, the other values will kind of go up and down because the, the, the water levels change and so on. Uh, uh, they show a lot more variation, but he gets very accurate results by integration. And if you look at these values, uh, that's zero watts. This is one milliwatt, and this is two milliwatts. So this is very sensitive. And you, all these red, red dots here give you a value of about 1.1 milliwatt, plus or minus one-tenth of a milliwatt. And, and the reason that you even have this small excess power is that controversial question about recombination. Uh, this is a control cell platinum, but you can still have recombination. Now, uh, we, we know as electrochemists that recombination is really not a deuterium and oxygen coming together. Uh, a deuterium does not oxidize with a platinum oxide covered anode. So you don't get any, any deuterium oxidizing with the anode. What you really get is oxygen being reduced at the, at the cathode, in this case the platinum cathode. Oxygen reduction is taking place, and that's, so that's some recombination. And, and this value for our current density, 200 milliamps, this value of 1.1 milliwatt is very close to what Fritz Wheel calculated many years before this, for the extent of recombination you would have at this, at this current, 200 milliamps. The recombination effect is 1.1 milliwatt, plus or minus 0.1 milliwatt. So that's the accuracy. You go to all the details that Martin goes through, the integration and so on, you can get that accuracy. Okay, next, uh, next slide. Okay. Well, I'll go through this kind of fast, but you can rearrange the equation. Uh, one thing you should always do firsthand is to assume there's no excess power and just calculate your cell constant. You can always do that. That's it. Uh, you, there's no problem. You can, you can always easily do that calculation. And then if you later know the excess power, you can calculate the true cell constant by putting in that. This is using the difference equation instead of the integration method. And then the difference between these two constants, the true constant minus the uh, lower bound, where you assume there's no excess power, times F to T, that, that gives you another way to get an excess power term. Okay, next to your graph, and I'm running out of time, so I'll skip through this. When I went to Japan, I didn't really know how to do the calculations, but I did stumble on what Martin later, what I later found out Martin suggested. As soon as no excess power and calculate the, uh, the cell constant you would get, assuming no excess power. Well, well, this particular cell did not produce much excess power, so it came out pretty close. Uh, it, it should have come out about what Martin reported later for a similar cell, not exactly the same cell, 0.85. But you can see it, there's a lot of fluctuations, but it, it averages out pretty close to what Martin later found out was 0.85 times 10 to minus 9 uh, watts per Read it before. Okay, next to next to read uh, At China Lake, of course, the end of our program, at least Navy funded program at China Lake, Dr. Kendra Johnson was a postdoc. And, and, and the, we, we worked on making a better calibrating. It was mostly his work. He, was, he spent a lot of time on this. But, but he was able actually to measure 
the uh, excess power produced when deuterium loads into plate. This is where you see, this is the cell, this is where he turns the cell current on, that's, and that's the current. This is how much power he puts in. This is excess power. And, and because deuterium is loading into the plate, and it's an exothermic reaction, we, for a couple of hours, about two hours, we've got an excess power effect. Yeah, uh, uh, it measured out about, about six milliwatts. So this is proof counterometer, heat conduction counterometer. We were able to measure within about plus or minus one milliwatt. And if you can integrate under this curve, the amount of heat we get agrees very closely to what the thermodynamic uh, tables tell you uh, that you should get. Uh, they were very close. What we actually measured and what we should have measured for the heat of loading of deuterium in the plate. Okay, next view graph. These are some of the things we did to improve the calorimetry. We used a copper inner tube and a copper outer tube for good heat transfer. We used foam insulation. Uh, he, he, he controlled the environmental temperature. He had, a, had a, all this enclosed in another box, so we controlled the temperature outside the cell. He even staked the lead wires to the bath so that there's always a constant effect of the lead wires in any. Uh, and a lot of little things we did uh, that really paid off in the end. Going from a plus or minus 20 milliwatt error to a plus or minus 1 milliwatt error in, in this improved calorimetry. Okay, the next, the next one. Okay, back to the store. I choose a pure isotheric calorimeter. The low cost, you can run in multiple cells on a low budget. Wide dynamic range, 20 degrees from the bat up to the boiling point. You can run the cell power from 0 up to 10 watts. Uh, self purifying because you like to wipe away any hydrogen contamination. The heat transfer is mostly by radiation if you have to do work out of the The safety of letting the D2 and O2 get out of the system. And, uh, and then that one idea right down again is that you can visibly see with the new power entry what if you're looking through glass, what is actually going on in the cell. And, uh, and that was important in some cases to see what was happening inside. And the high accuracy, uh, uh, plus or minus 0 0.1 milliwatt or plus or minus 0.01%. Uh, okay, next to the graph, just acknowledgement. Financial support from an anonymous fund from the Denver, through the Denver Foundation. It goes through Dixie State College where I grew up in St. George, Utah. It's managed, it is managed by Kayleen Larson from Dixie College and Lynn Miles, my wife, does all the graphs and most of my computer work. So I would like to thank her. Okay, thank you.